Hi, uh, this is Andrea speaking. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, first event of the Azure Data Fest, where uh, we will bring a, a little bit of taste from the October Fest in Europe uh, here to Singapore, but in the form of data and AI uh, sessions. So, um, if we see at uh, our calendar, uh, this is the first uh, session of a series of uh, um, workshops and deep dives, uh, basically, that we have organized to let you better understand uh, what uh, uh, the data and AI uh, stack uh, is from, uh, and a vision is from uh, Microsoft. Uh, we will start today giving you an introduction on how we ambition to ingest data into, uh, and especially big data, into Azure to perform analytics. And then in the following sessions, we will be discovering more uh, tools, more ways to analyze your big data sets in a performant way. We will uh, talk about uh, data governance as well. And then uh, uh, machine learning and uh, how you can train machine learning models with a low code approach as well as a number of topics uh, to detail the infrastructure um, setup and configuration that uh, can be performed in order to implement all this in your environments. So said this, uh, a few um, notes here. Go to the next slide. Right. So at Microsoft, uh, we see sustainability and the humanity's response to climate change as one of the greatest challenges of our lifetime. And we believe it is not too late for a cleaner and greener future. And so as part of our commitment to sustainability, Microsoft Singapore will be planting a tree for every person attending this event. Now a few housekeeping rules before we get uh, we get started. So the session is being recorded and will be available on demand afterwards for those of you that want to replay. You can ask uh, questions throughout the session, so we will make it interactive. You have uh, um, a Q&A panel in which you can ask your questions. I will be your moderator and I'll publish those questions so we can uh, try to answer them during the presentation. But at the same time, uh, we are also reserving 10 minutes uh, at the end of this session to elaborate on some more key questions or those questions uh, that uh, require a little bit more of explanation. All right, so uh, uh, just remember that uh, as an attendee, you can participate to Q&A, uh, but we will, so it will be a text base, right? And uh, we will not be able to share uh, video and audio, and this is for interest for the interest of uh, every participant. This, I am uh, your uh, uh, moderator for today. Um, my name is Andrea. I am a cloud solution architect specializing on data and AI in the Singapore in Microsoft Singapore, and uh, I'm joined by our main presenter and uh, our main man for uh, today, Rohan. Uh, Rohan uh, is uh, part of my team as well, part of Microsoft Singapore, a cloud solution architect specializing on data and AI. And uh, Rohan, over to you to uh, take us through the bulk of the content of, uh, of today's session. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Andrea, for, for presenting and going to the initial session. And good morning, good afternoon to everyone, whoever has joined, uh, and thanks for joining our one of the first live events for Oktoberfest. Um, I think Andrea has already shared the entire uh, sequence of events that we are going to have, essentially to cover all the uh, points that take you from a journey from creating a warehouse, maintaining it, uh, governance aspect, doing machine learning, and end to end, right? So this is one of the first sessions where essentially our intent is to go through um, uh, the ingestion patterns, uh, what a modern data warehouse looks like, what are the patterns and how from Azure perspective, we are trying to simplify the entire process, bringing in all the chain and you know uh, touch points inside a single pane, right? 
Um, now going ahead. Uh, Andrew, can you stop sharing? Uh, yeah. OK, uh, so this is kind of our agenda for the journey. So first of all, we would want to cover our data platform journey uh, right from where it started to where we are. It has been uh, 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 there have been a lot of significant events. There have been a lot of architectural changes that have happened over time, and we want to have a, a, a high level view of what those patterns are. And after that, we'll show what a data warehouse architecture uh, looks like. And uh, we're going to talk about different services uh, that can that you might be using on on day in day out basis for ingestion patterns. And then what we're going to do is essentially walk through a use case. I give you a live demo scenario where you'll understand the feature perspective that we're trying to demonstrate and how essentially they can help you in in doing uh, doing and building up your data warehouse, the lake house more efficiently along with with the Azure services. And eventually there will be a Q&A session where you are more than happy to you know, post all the questions and we'll try to answer as many of your questions. And if there are any still, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be sharing our contacts as well. Um, now this is where we started from. Um, initially uh, we were working with data warehouse, right? And which were mainly uh, built on for operational reporting purposes. So they were limited to almost structured data. So you had your operational data and you were ingesting some some form of external data as well. And what you were doing is you were transforming the data and eventually storing it in, in a relational data model. And that model decided what were the consumption pattern in your reports and, and you know how this was used by end users. So this had this was this had a very huge success rate, but initial uh, at initial stages, but as more sort of a variety of the data started coming in. There were challenges to it and also when when after 2000 when the data um, uh, exploration happened, right? Uh, what happened was the um, volume of data that used to come in was also hard to manage essentially by traditional RDBMS systems. So the key takeaway was the data warehouses are built uh, essentially mostly and all with structured data and there's hard schema on enforcement, meaning the schema on write. Whenever you write a data, the schema has already been defined. And that essentially is defined by what are the use cases that you're trying to consume via your reports, right? Uh, the modeling used to happen. Um, the stage two where we uh, come from is when we started having problems with the kind of data we were dealing with. So data warehouses dealt primarily with just structured data. And after that, we started having the data like emails, PDF, more sort of semi and, and unstructured data happen. Um, the data warehouse was kind of falling short with all the options. Hence, we started having uh, data leaks. So underlying data lake, we had something called a compute HDFS in which all the files were broken down into, into small blocks. And essentially it was take all your data, dump in a data lake, and we'll figure out data how to extract and do that. So from schema on right, where schema was tightly coupled with what the use case, what the data model will look like, it was like you we were trying to dump in all the data in the data lake. And later, depending upon what kind of usage patterns we were we would be having to consume the data, this data will be picked up. And the biggest advantage of both data lakes were it started to support all sorts of varied use cases. So it was from from report uh, BI reporting purpose to to uh, running machine learning and data science use cases. It supported a wide variety of of you know use cases, and that was kind of the biggest selling point for a data lake. So. Also, the data lake was supported by uh, three Vs, right? Volume, velocity, and variety. So the volume also was because um, essentially, right from the volume of data that was ingested was pretty huge, right? And you could just dump in the data, and then the compute would basically come in, and you could you could essentially you know uh, churn in that volume of data by adding more and more nodes. Um, the velocity also now you could work with streaming data. A real time data ingestion was also there. So basically there were different architectures that were supported by Delta Lake right from uh, from um, uh, Kappa architecture to Lambda architecture where you would have batch ingestion where you have a streaming ingestion uh, um, um, row line within within your platform and essentially it will support all. And the last but not the least was variety. Um, so as I said, you could deal with structured, semi-structured, unstructured data, and it was just about it, it's similar analogy to uh, Azure Blob, where you just take your data, dump it in there, irrespective of what kind of format the data is, it will just be used later for consumption, where you would have different tools sets for actually analyzing the data. 
Now there was one more V that was kind of compromised when we we're using a Delta Lake was, uh, should I say, what was the value add, right? So over a period of time in 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 an enterprise, right, when we're using Delta Lake, the problem started to come when these de data lakes uh, started to become like a data swamp, meaning um, when you just push the data in a data lake, essentially there was no schema conformity, right? A schema on read. So you push all kinds of data and every data lake was working in a silo. So the amount of value that uh, an enterprise could go with essentially started to reduce uh, eventually. And that's a statistics about only 30 to 40 percent of the entire data lake projects have have realized their actual value. So there was definitely a problem and because working in silo was also having a, a significant effect and impact on the governance standards. So it was very hard to actually govern and create a data lineage across different data lakes that was being used within an enterprise. Now move to 2020, we are somewhere very close to working on data lake houses. Where the concept of lake house was introduced. So essentially what, what the concept is, you completely detach the compute and uh, the, the storage. And essentially you would be using a singular set of pane for storage across all your all sorts of your uh, ingested data. It also supports different uh, all the structures, some structure and unstructured data, but your streaming data sets and your batch ingestion data sets will reside in the similar format in this thing. And then essentially you would just be using those data sets to you know, uh, report on top of it. And also they would support all the machine learning use cases and, and data science use cases as well. Um, moving ahead, uh, this is in essence a very simplistic uh, tiered architecture in our Azure um, um, on, on, on using Azure services. So you have your all sorts of ingestion data on your left hand side where you have your relation RDBMS which is sitting on your on prem. You could have different data coming from different cloud services and then you have your SaaS data from Salesforce and Dynamics. You ingest all the data in, and land up in your ingestion or the raw zone. And this is primarily used by Azure Data Factory. Once the data is ingested, what you do is you kind of cleanse the data, prepare the data, and, and essentially the tool for choice is here. You can use if it's um, uh, if it's like your Hadoop workloads and you're running all your Spark jobs, you can very much leverage Databricks or you can use Azure Data Factory uh, as well to, to basically transform, I mean, cleanse the data. Once it's cleansed, you move it to another layer, which is your where your actual data, cleanse data resides, transform data resides, and you en already enrich it from different streams uh, that are coming from. So there might be a use case where you would need to, you know, um, join the data that is coming from your relational database as well as coming from different cloud vendors, maybe an S3 bucket from AWS, and then you combine it and then and you know um, uh, prepare and and push it on the on on in the in the transform layer. Eventually, everything what you have transformed will be served using Azure SQL Data Warehouse and consumed via Power BI. So this is a sense just a, a flow of how the data flows is in the architecture and this is a layered approach which which modern data warehouse architecture you would you would be able to uh, uh, see this in in almost every architecture that you see um, now from from data lake house perspective right if i just tell you that you know all the um, all the all the tools and and that we're using in the private can be done in a single pane of, of window, right? Now the problem there is if you're using Azure Data Factory, if you're using uh, Azure Databricks or using other tools, right? Everything works, but the problem is you have to hop and skip from one workspace to the other and then, you know, it's kind of it's kind of not a seamless experience. But what we have done is with our Synapse Analytics, everything that you want to transform, you can ingest, you can you can use the Synapse Analytics from a single uh, uh, workflow pane, which is a Synapse Studio, and essentially do everything save the data and then you know even con uh, the power bi connector you can consume and and create your reports inside the synapse analytics right so this is that's that's what we are trying to demonstrate in this today's uh, use case as well and which we'll be discussing further down so what is azure synapse analytics right it is essentially we talked about a data lake and we talked about a data warehouse right so in short azure synapse analytics brings uh, the unison of both the worlds, right? Where you would be able to leverage uh, the volume velocity and you know uh, from from Delta Lake, and and you would be able to model your data and have an asset compliance on top of it, and from from the warehouse perspective, right? So it gives you best of both the worlds, and you would have 
um, essentially you can you can query the data that your model with with either SQL runtime or you would have your Spark as well. So we'll, we'll discuss the architecture as well, but essentially uh, the Synapse Analytics will will give you uh, you know a singular um, um, look and feel pane, and you would be able to leverage uh, and query data uh, according to your choice of runtime that you want. Uh, so what is Azure Synapse Analytics, right? We are trying to define the architecture here. So it's a platform where um, you would. So the first thing that that to be realized is for Synapse, the compute and the storage is completely decoupled. So wherever what most of the um, 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 it, and it works perfectly fine with with common data model, your data lakes and anything. So all the data that that is being processed will store mostly in ADFS, right? Delta Lake storage. And this is where it has been optimized for even big data workloads as well. Uh, and on top of it is the platform, right? Now, um, going ahead, you have certain platform parameters where, in the, I mean, you know, you would have uh, platform services from management, security, monitoring, Metastore uh, that will be enabled uh, when you're using the Synapse Analytics. And um, now the first layer is about data integration, right? And what do you do once you once you so you can pull the data that is sitting on top of ADLS with either two runtime. It, it has provisioned a Spark, a, a Spark runtime as well as a SQL pool you can use, whether it's a provision or an on demand to query the data that is actually residing inside your data lake storage, right? Um, and as I said, right, you have at this point in time, we have SQL pools both in, in an on demand uh, a matter where you basically what you do is uh, um, it's a serverless SQL pool essentially, so you don't need to provision for any clusters. You would be paid for how much data is being consumed and processed. And the other form is where the traditional way of where you go and you provision and you create a cluster, and then uh, you know you depending upon the your workload, you choose how many nodes it needs to have, and you can do all those, those configurations. But essentially, that's the option. And the Apache Spark time you have only uh, provisioned. So at this point in time, serverless uh, Spark pool isn't available. Uh, but but essentially provisions with with uh, Spark provisions SQL pool, you will be able to obviously um, query all the data that is residing in in ADLS, and that data can have any source, shape, and form. It can be a JSON uh, uh, packet. It can be a CSV file. It can be a Parquet file. It can be your Delta Lake as well form. So, so you can pretty much query the data. Um, along with it, what there is support for multiple languages. So you have SQL, Python, .NET, Java, the choice of a language, and you know uh, for different analytical workloads. Now, the most important, should I say, the experience for which is, is you have uh, this, all the things bundled up in, in an Analytics Studio, right? Where you could see different services and it, it has very tight integration. And I'm going to show you as well with machine learning, IoT, and, and you know, with, with uh, BI uh, as well, right? Um, so essentially, this is um, this is the entire architecture of Synapse Analytics and and we will have a demo of it in, in the coming uh, slides as well. And I'm going to show you how basically you can query the underlying data, which is in the data like storage using uh, Synapse SQL pool, uh, uh, you know. OK, so this is what I want. This is another another view of the entire analytics ecosystem, right? So essentially um, you have ADF pipeline. So for ingesting the data, you can use ADF pipeline and you can use ADF mapping data flows. Uh, if we, uh, people will be uh, coming from SSIS and uh, and world will be very much comfortable and understand that you know pipelines are essentially nothing but they they have their own steps where you can create a pipeline and run it on a scheduled basis. Um, then we have a storage layer which pretty much has uh, everything. So you have a relational database, you have ADLS Gen two uh, as well. So these Spark tables and Cosmo DB are also supported. And what we're going to show today is. Um, if I go to the third layer of compute with with SQL on demand pool, we can pretty much query uh, data that is residing on the ADLS Gen 2 uh, on the Spark side and Cosmo DB. So essentially what it's doing is giving you a singular pane with Spark SQL pool. Now your data must might, might be residing anywhere, but what you can do is you can query it using T SQL, right? And and it, it reads uh, the Parquet files as well. And with Cosmo DB, um, if you have an HTAP enabled uh, table, you can in, in almost near real time, you can query the data and create a view and, and do all sorts of reporting, right? So essentially, and this is for on demand for provision SQL. Obviously, it has a very tight coupling with the relational database, 
Um, so this database is accessible in Anapps Analytics Studio, and you can also, if you're using SQL Server Management uh, Studio as well, you can. Uh, like I'll show you where the endpoints are available, and you can pretty much query any of these um, relational database uh, uh, on your on your uh, machine uh, SSMS as well. And and the third one is Apache uh, Apache uh, uh, Spark tools. So with it, you can you have an option of choice of whether using want to use Python, Scala, C sharp to basically query whether it's obviously Spark table, and you can also query whether it's it's on the ADLS Gen two as well. Now. Uh, and if it has a very tight coupling I'll, um, in, in our demo. We'll show that, you know, uh, the power BI, you can very much consume everything in the Synapse Studio and create a very uh, a, a, a power BI report for consumption as well. Right. So that's the flow. Um, uh, that's the entire analytic ecosystem right now. Coming to the use case for today, right? Uh, and, and the key takeaway from today would be that what I'm what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to Query these three type of data and they might be sitting on your on prem or anywhere, right? Um, and what we're going to use is is three different ways, right? So we'll copy first of all with with uh, uh, taxi data I'm using, which is generally available. So for 2015, what we're going to use, we're going to use uh, essentially a Synapse pipeline, right? So we'll copy the data um, and, and push it onto ADLS2 in terms of uh, in a parquet format. And then what we're going to use is using Synapse Server SQL pool, we'll create a view, right? For the data sec for the second type of uh, data use case, it's it's just the taxi data for 2018 uh, use case. We'll have a Spark pool, right? That will create and we'll will read it using a data frame, push the data on ADLS, and then uh, create a Spark table on top of it. And then from the Spark table, we'll be able to create the view, right? And 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 with the third for the third one, this is essentially I want to show the integration with the Cosmo DB. So with the Cosmo DB, if you have uh, so basically we have an edge tap uh, hybrid transaction analytical processing. So where you can create a table which is which is OLAP for meant for uh, OLAP, and and then essentially what you can do is using Synapse link, you can sitting in in Synapse SQL, you can basically query the data in near real time, right? And then essentially the point here is. You have three different types of data residing in three different locations, and what you're going to do is simplistically you have you using different ways and means within the in the in the, within the Synapse Analytics ecosystem, create three different types of views, and then once the views are created, you can very well consume it in the Power BI, right? So that's that's the use case that we are trying to implement today. So I'll take a pause here before going ahead, and are there are there any questions? So Rohan, uh, there were a few questions uh, in the uh, in the chat. Um, one of them is uh, whether uh, we can integrate uh, data factory with the mainframes to retrieve the data, and so we have uh, uh, answered that. Uh, it, it basically depends on the uh, underlying technology that you are used. That there are ways to integrate uh, with uh, with mainframe, for example. Uh, if you are leveraging, uh, say, DB2 on uh, ZOS uh, uh, from IBM, there are connectors for that. As well as we have attached some other links uh, from an architectural perspective to, uh, to that uh, provide some more information on the mechanics to basically bring the data over to Azure from, uh, from mainframes. Uh, sure. This was uh, one. There's a, um, a second question on um, uh, data warehouse uh, benchmarking and uh, we have attached uh, there some uh, third party research that does comprehensive ben benchmarking on data warehouses on the cloud and that show the results from Synapse. Sure. So, so just to elaborate the question on the mainframe side, uh, see, uh, while you have the native connector for the DB2 ZOS, right, which as Andrea told, uh, most of the scenarios where you see the mainframe databases are not a relational in the world. Like uh, when you're, if your backend is using, let's say, IDMS, or a nomad kind of a database. So what you can do is you can always write a COBOL CICS DB2 program. Uh, depends on the utility that you're using, or maybe a JCL to take the dump of the hierarchical database, uh, uh, running a, basically a COB CICS uh, IDMS program or a COB CICS DB2 program if it is an online transactional, and take a dump as a VZAM file or some file, and then pick it up as enough pipeline. So there are various ways. More we learn the use cases, more we can talk about that. Um, but uh, as Andrea said, yes, uh, the ZOS is uh, natively available for DB2. 
Yeah, and and absolutely, and and even when you, I mean, the 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 connectors are available, but the problem will lie when you're trying to convert the global file into any of the you know uh, other native uh, formats that that you can consume in 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 a process with Spark. So so pretty much that can be done. It can be done. Um, all right. So even now, if we if we move ahead, right? I just wanted to have a discussion about because we're gonna for a very heavily use serverless SQL pool. What exactly is serverless SQL pool, and and you know uh, what are the advantages? Should I say of using it? So essentially, um, serverless SQL pool is is where you don't have to serverless is serverless. You understand, right? You don't have to worry about the provisioning. You only pay for uh, uh, you know what you use. And and you know you don't have to worry about the scaling as well. So these three definitions are pretty much consistent with what the serverless Spark pool and and you know this thing. So essentially, uh, what you want to do is um, uh, so so the best part is uh, the table definition that you create with Spark pool are automatically synced. The metadata is, uh, is is pretty much available with SQL pool service as well. So once you create any Spark uh, Spark table, it should be available to query with serverless SQL pool as well. So I'm going to show you that. And and this is uh, actually a very good integration because no matter what choice of tool you use to basically process your data, essentially you will have the if your if your end users or your data engineers are very comfortable using, let's say, uh, you know, part or, or should I say, a batch of data engineers are very comfortable using uh, serverless, uh, you know, SQL. So what you can do is you can do your heavy lift and shift using a Spark and then create tables on top of it, and then which you, which you can absolutely query using SQL. And that SQL and and that this is exactly once a view is created, you can use it by Power BI and query them with SSMS as well. You know, uh, so so that's one very um, uh, advantageous thing that the interoperability between different um, components within Synapse Analytics is fabulous, right? It doesn't matter what you're using to transform. It doesn't matter what you're reading. It doesn't matter which 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 runtime you're you're processing it. It is available across, so you don't have to work too much to basically, you know, convert and and you know, uh, provision the views and the table that you have done. It, it's pretty much um, uh, seamless. So I'm I'm going to demonstrate that as well. So just the benefits like direct query files on Azure SQL, absolutely you can do. You can, I mean, uh, we'll show it to you as well. Uh, now this is also important from a logical data warehouse perspective, right? So this is essentially the crux of our use case. So no matter where your uh, source definitions are lying, you can use CSLs here to create a, a, a virtualized layer of, or should I say, a views, right? If people are very comfortable with views, a different views, and underlying those views can refer to different tables. One can convert to the Spark pool, and and, and you know, it might be re uh, leveraging to some of the Parquet files that are saved over here. And it's easy transformation data. It supports um, any tool and library that uses T-SQL and query data. So essentially uh, everything is supported and uh, this point automatically synchronize tables from Spark. So whatever you create here, the metadata definition will obviously be synced across with SQL pool and you will be able to pretty much query on the fly. Um, so this this pretty um, um, if I may say this is pretty much like a paper query that you're writing, right? Um, so so you're just writing the query. Essentially, it's gonna uh, do with it, but this is not a provision SQL pool uh, where you have to worry about you know um, uh, like a cluster where you wherever you work with a cluster uh, provisioning it, starting it, stopping it, and a hot and a cold run. It doesn't work like that, um, right? Um, no infrastructure, no upfront cost, no no resource reservation. Um, and pay only for a Go model. So, so you know that these are the standard different. I mean, these are the uh, key benefits of using a Synapse serverless pool. Um, this is also important to understand. Uh, we we define certain recommended uses where this might be. So, for quick data exploration, where your data is sitting essentially in your uh, as your storage, and it supports different file formats. As I said, right? It doesn't matter Parquet, CSV, JSON, um, whatever, and you can directly connect. Uh, 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 for consumption for uh, you know to the power bi as well so whatever is lying there just connect it uh, through the sql servers and it's going to query the data and give you the results back um, the logical data warehouse is much more like um, you know a virtualized tables that you create uh, you can also go ahead there are more than one type of table that you can create actually you can create materialized views you can create external tables but essentially um, at this point in time we'll, we'll show this feature with just creating views and then kind of like you know um, consuming in the power bi and you have enterprise grade security model. You can provide your low row level security, column level security. You have transparent data encryption feature that you can enable um, essentially to safeguard all the access as well as provisioning for uh, you know across the user base as well. 
um, and it's pretty easy to transform the data. Um, you know, at the click, you can just convert the CSV to parquet format and, 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 and you know, um, uh, whatever uh, account that you have created, you can pretty much move the data between different, uh, you know, uh, containers and accounts. Um, uh, and, and it has obviously uh, where there's a need for creating uh, uh, external storage as well, uh, external tables as well. You can basically create it and the external table data will be essentially stored it in, in the ADLS. Um, in form of parquet. So that's pretty much about uh, Synapse Equilibrium's pool. And uh, this is the point where we are trying to reiterate that uh, this is how you create a, a, a logical data warehouse with the data that is sitting in your Azure storage and underlying it might be a parquet file, delta file, and then you create your views on top of it, essentially to be coded out by Power BI um, and consumed with Power BI, right? Um, so this is pretty much an abstract layer and, and you can pretty much create it with serverless SQL pool. Um, it also has a direct connector. So, so uh, with that, let me start with the demo, right? That we have prepared. So, essentially, um, at first, I would like to start with how um, your um, uh, just one second, your Synapse workspace looks like, right? So, this is a single pane of entry where once you provision and create for Synapse uh, workspace, you create a container, you attach a primary container to this and you will land in here. So, so just to see, right, I was talking about this uh, SQL pools and this here you can see um, by default, you get a built-in serverless pool. This is by default grid. And if a need be, you can, this is what we have created um, for a SQL provision dedicated pool. So this is a DW100C, uh, the bare, uh, the lowest, should I say size, um and and you know uh, for this particular one so we have also a spark um uh, sql pool as a, a sorry spark pool as well which is a medium core which is about 8 gb cores and 64 gb about 10 nodes right and and this is you can choose from from low medium and high and and on whatever use case you are you're working on you can choose the configuration accordingly um, there are certain other things for monitoring perspective which is pretty standard across any microsoft service so you can create an alerts um, uh, pretty much if and there are different matrices out of the box available as well. So so you can create uh, some alerts uh, here and and you know um, depending upon I think I had one created, but it's it's not showing up anyways. So these are standard ones. Now, how do we access it uh, essentially, right? Uh, so we have to go to Stunapp Studio um, and uh, let me open it, right? This Snap Studio. So essentially this is the home page where you land up to um, once you create and, and launch the studio, right? So um, this is where we start with. This is the home screen and, and essentially you, uh, it gives you some some uh, 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 jumpstart uh, buttons for ingesting, exploring, analyze and visualize. So let me go back to the screen and kind of walk you through the uh, use case that we are going to discuss first, right? So um, we were here, right? So OK. So first we'll talk about the New York taxi data, right? The, this taxi data 2015 uh, is in the CSV form and we're going to use the copy data um, uh, ADF to, to basically copy this data essentially from, from a CSV file and to ADLS. And, and this data could have been say uh, um, uh, essentially uh, lying on your, um, you know, on-prem. But right now, just to show, um, I'm getting this data from, um, just once again, from, OK, from any of this, this this is publicly available data set, right? So I'm just going to create an HTTP connection. It's going to get the data from this uh, particular um, uh, URI, uh, URL and, and get the data, right? So um, you just let this page to load on and I'm going to show you what the data looks like. Um, so this is uh, it's going to take the data. I'm going to use this API to essentially uh, um, uh, hit this endpoint and copy the data in, in a CSV format, right? So how I do it is essentially I go to my workspace uh, studio. Sorry. I go to the studio and um, uh, so, OK, let me just walk you through the studio as well. So in different one, this is the data tab where uh, you would be able to see your workspace and what databases, what, what have you in, in your workspace, right? So what databases have you created? So at this point in time, I've created one provision SQL pool. So this automatically comes once you have created a SQL provision pool. Um, and then this is these the difference is you can see the warehouse symbols and this is newer taxi SQL is just the on demand SQL pool. I have two other type of default Spark and and what uh, Spark Spark tables as well databases, right? Um, 
Now moving on to the linked one, you can see I have created a link connection, right? Uh, to Azure Cosmo DB, uh, ADLS Gen 2 and integrated data sets, right? Uh, there is another pane where you can actually have a, an understanding of how much linked uh, services that you have and essentially created there as well. So, so if you go under external connection, link services, here you can see all the link services that you have created, right? So the uh, this is actually the link service that we are going to use to copy the data for 2018, right? And uh, how we do it essentially is just by um, copying the data. Sorry, if the pipelines, if I go um, copy the NY data, if you see, just give me a minute, please. It's okay. So um, you see, uh, we are copying the data. This is the copy data uh, quicker. And uh, the source is I'm getting the data from um, uh, the same endpoint. Um, same endpoint and uh, essentially giving certain to to basically escape character. These are, these are the basic settings and what we can do is you can test the connection as well and it should go through fine. Um, so now what this this copy data thing is going to do is it's going to copy the data from the HDB endpoint and essentially push it onto my my um, ADLS right uh, in a parquet format. So um, and then what I'm going to do is just wait for 10 seconds and then essentially transform the data using Spark. So you see here I'm using a SQL pool, SQL to just uh, ADF to basically ingest the data and then essentially I, I have the choice to basically use any of the activities whether I want to use data breaks as your functions and you know um, um, even the notebooks to essentially transform the data. So um, let me walk you through to what we are doing in the transformation. Um, so if you go here and you look at the notebooks, right? Um, all right. So, all right. So, so here, okay, let me first show you the data that is residing once we have run the flow. Um, it's going to land up on my, um, on my contain, on my, on my data store, which is here. So if you go here in the, in the workspace, I have, um, I have the primary storage account and in the storage account you see. Um, sorry. Containers, and this is <coughs> the primary one. So what I'm doing is I am creating different layers, right? A raw layer, a staging layer and and, and you know uh, before I, I get the data, I push it everything on the raw, raw layer and essentially once the data lands there. So this is the data once I run my uh, and my copy and hit this endpoint. This is the data dump for this one. Um, so this is in the form of parquet and you can and you know um, what you can do is you can very much go in and and uh, view it with the data frame as well. So let me just jump back to my screen where I'm going to show you. Um, OK, so this is once the data has landed there, what I'm doing is using a notebook to basically transform the data, right? So um, first is I'm just importing PySpark library, right? Then you see this data is in form of CSV and I'm just, uh, you know, um, uh, um, taking the data, uh, ingesting it and, and, you know, just displaying the data. Then what I'm doing is essentially, um, sorry, just let me go here. And then what I'm doing is essentially uh, deduping the data. So uh, my data has got certain uh, uh, passenger count and trip distance where the value is less than zero. So I'm, I'm kind of you know filtering them out, performing some deduplication and then printing out the schema. And then essentially um, I'm kind of redefining the schema for the entire data frame and adding few columns, adding adding a trip uh, month here day, which I'll be using for essentially uh, uh, in, the, in my report and then writing eventually in form of a CSV file, right? And saving it in the staging layer. So what I've done is I'm, I'm using the layered approach where I'm taking the data, pushing onto the raw layer, then I'm using a notebook to copy the data from, from raw and then pushing onto the staging. Uh, now, once the, that data has been pushed onto the staging, uh, what I'm doing is essentially I am uh, creating a data on top of it. And then this is this will push the data essentially to um, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a Spark table, right? So I'm creating the database in my taxi, which I showed you uh, the database as, as existing here. Um, 
sorry, where did it go? Workspace, and you should be able to see here in the database, NYTaxi, right? Um, sorry, this one, Spark, Spark database. And then within NYTaxi, I'm creating a table. Sorry. So within NYTaxi, I am creating um, a table. Please open up. Okay. Uh, here you go. And uh, uh, trip, right? And then essentially, this is going to push the, all the data in this trip, right? So uh, what I can do is I can pretty much create a new script, SQL script and then essentially query this data as well. Uh, once it creates, it's essentially is just a T SQL to query the data and uh, I can I can run it and and this will just should you should be able to see all the data that is there, right? So what we are doing is here is is using as I said right for for this particular pipeline um, which we sorry um, for this particular pipeline which we had is is um, we took the data from um, hitting an, an HTTP and get the data using copy data uh, pushing on an ADLS in form of parquet. Then we are transforming this data using Spark, right? And then um, uh, creating a Spark table on top of it, right? Now that's that's pretty much uh, 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 you know you you see the interoperability between different runtimes and query times, right? Um, now this particular second one is is where we are using um, uh, just to copy the data and and what we are doing is let me show you uh, and then essentially creating a different view on top of it right for a 2015 data set. So this is again I'm copying from the same uh, URL as it's a publicly available. Let me just show you that as well. I think I closed my. Um, oh, it's there. OK. So this is the same from from URL. We have a different one in 2015, so I'm copying it. So if I go to my Azure um, space, um, the studio, I have um, Python created, right? So I'm just copying the data, and you see this copy task here. Sorry, let me let it open. It's working a bit slow, my end. Sorry, what happened? OK, so this is the same just copy data. It's essentially just uh, uh, um, uh, it's just copying the data essentially from HTTP and pushing onto the same um, uh, sync uh, in, 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 a, in a delta format, right? And um, uh, essentially, if you, you can view the data as well, uh, let me open it uh, where and show you how once this is run, I can show, uh, let me just run it. It will just copy the data and uh, this is how you monitor it. It's queued, it's going to run and push the data essentially on. And let me run the New York taxi data as well, data sets. Um, so, sorry, it's not started. Um, OK, so once the data is actually copied, it's going to come and it's going to reside. Sorry, my screen froze. Just give me a minute, guys. Um, it's going to come and it's going to reside and you can have a look in ADLS Gen 2. So this is the same um, workspace where we created the different layers and uh, you can see that essentially once the data is loaded, Give it a minute. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so so what I was also saying is that um, meanwhile it gets followed. Let me just show you uh, the third one. So for, for Cosmo DB, right? The third I use one. What we have done is I can show you um, the, the data in Cosmo DB as well first. So um, in Cosmo DB, what I've done is I have just uh, inserted some of the sample data. Right, and this is an edge tap one, um, uh, Cosmo DB edge tap one. So if you go here, um, okay, and now it actually data you see here, um, and 
what I've done is essentially created a container. Um, right, so if you go to data explore over here, um, what you can do is you can create two kind of tables, right? Either you can create a transactional table or an analytic process table. So, so basically, if you want to query the data for using a lab synapse link, what you need to do is if you need to go to the feature and enable this as app synapse link as on, right? Once you do that, the table that you create will be edge tap um, uh, enabled. So, and what essentially that it means is you can say so uh, uh, Cosmo DB is a columnar database, right? And and you can keep on pushing the data and 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 you know essentially if it's edge tap enabled, it will automatically um, uh, you know create uh, should I say um, 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 create the columns and 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 you you know create indexes on top of it and it's going to be very much faster to essentially you know query so with data explorer um okay you can see here uh, these are different um, uh, um you know uh, this is the container and if i open the invite taxi table and if i show you the items um this is pretty much uh you know you can see a partition them on the vendor id and we can query the data over here and and you know um i can show you um sorry yeah this one open query we can sorry kit query and we can pretty much query the query the data that is there and just, just going to show you the json packets now on the synapse side uh once you go uh here to the workspace uh, you can create a synapse link and this link is essentially where I showed you um, um, just come over here and um, link service. You can create a link service uh, essentially just select. Sorry, it's, it's working a bit slow. So essentially uh, once you go to the link service, you can select the Cosmo DB and if it's a SQL API, let me just show you quickly. Um, link service new, although I've created, but I'm still going to show you here. How do you create it? You can show over here. Club. OK, you can choose. Cosmo DB and this is a SQL API. If I press continue, it should be able to resolve the, uh, this thing and I can choose my subscription. Okay. Um, subscription and uh, and then it should be able to uh, show me the uh, container name and then it uh, as long as that edge tap is enabled uh, it should be able to see the database that you has right so you see you see these four database and once you select the database then you're good to create so this is what i've already created here as cosmo db2 and once that is created you can very much go and query the data or you can create uh, via via a sql pool or or you can go and and you know essentially query it via via loading into a data frame as well so i can show you that as well um i think i should have that right um cosmo db um this is the one i can show you the view create so, so this is how you can create the view here you have to first create the entity providing your sas and a secret key and then you just go in and create so the, uh, the, the 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 secret sauce here is an open row set so essentially um this will be able to query so it has already a uh, inbuilt connector that is created so for cosmo db and and using this you would be able to directly query the data that is sitting uh, in in the cosmo db right and once this view is created and you can also um, essentially do it with notebooks, you can you can load the data in the data frame. So essentially uh, you see this Cosmo OLAP is also again as a format creator. It's the same thing. You're just reading the data that is already uh, connected via that link service. Uh, and and uh, what I'm doing is essentially I'm, I'm reading the data from here. Um, I can run it. I can show you I'm um, reading the data and it's going to show you exactly uh, what the data is underlying. I think Levy has failed. Uh, I think job failed runtime source dependency. I think the problem with the cluster. So uh, my cluster is still not on. Sorry, I'll, I'll do it. But essentially this code will run and you would be able to, um, you know, uh, um, uh, import the file and then create and I'm pushing the, uh, the data in the same database, right? SQL pool in which I had created earlier, right? So you, you invite taxi data. If you go and look here and, and I've created this, this table, right? So if I go there and, and show you uh, uh, in the database, 
So NY Raxi data you see here with the same Spark pool, and here I have created, uh, uh, you know, um, sorry, in the in the. Sorry, just let me open uh, this. This is a bit slow, so I've created um, the views, right? You see here. So I've already created in invite taxi data and I've created multiple views where you can see uh, these three different views and you can query it, right? So, um, so once these views are created, what you can do is uh, you can, uh, and this is the workspace is pretty much embedded with Power BI. So you don't need to go outside this. Uh, if you have a, a Power BI work, uh, your workspace created, what you can do is uh, you can pretty much uh, create a Power BI report essentially running inside. Um, so let me just show you uh, where it is. Um, sorry, just give me a minute. So once once you see this Power BI connector. So essentially this Power BI workspace is already created and this is connected to my Power BI workspace and this says you can import the data set there and and pretty much create a, a report on top of it, right? So this is essentially uh, the report that is fetching the data from all the three data sets that we talked about. Um, and uh, you know, um, uh, essentially it should show you the result sets. Um, but this is whole end to end, right? So you see no matter where your data is sitting, whether it's on prem, you can pick up the data, you can choose any format of your liking and on top of it, you have your uh, runtime as well and it is supported by multiple languages, right? So uh, and, and this is all done in a single play pane of, you know, um, you don't have to jump anywhere else and and you know in going for you, we'll also show you the embedding of, of the Synapse workspace with ML ops. And then we're going to also show you how Purview is embedded and you can do governance features on top of these data sets as well, right? Um, so that is pretty much about the the uh, the demo as well. Uh, uh, any any I'll stop here and, and for any questions that you have, uh, Andre, are there any questions that? Thanks, sir, thanks for uh, driving us through. Um, yeah, there were a few. Uh, Actually, a lot of many questions uh, while you were uh, you were talking. Maybe I'll start from the recent one. Is uh, exactly how did you connect it to Cosmos DB um, uh, in in this case? Uh, were you uh, leveraging uh, a Polybase or uh, uh, exactly what connectors did you configure to connect to Cosmos? Essentially, this is I showed have I have already showed it. So this is with the link service. I I, I think I already had a run through. How do you create a link service? Sorry, the, the screen is pretty much stuck in my hand. But um, once you go and you can create a new link service as I showed earlier. And it, uh, but only thing is your your uh, container should be uh, 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 link service enabled, right? So it's automatically going to go and 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 you know I, I showed earlier. So it, it it's it's the same way. You can query the data that is lying in in Cosmo DB. All right. Uh, um, let's see for uh, uh, a few questions. Uh, earlier on, I think we have uh, addressed them uh, into the chat. There were questions on how data would be represented uh, uh, within. Uh, so Spark table would be represented uh, within uh, uh, within the cluster. And so we. Uh, we answered that so that the physical data is stored in uh, data lake uh, uh, as well. Data lake. Uh, as well. Yeah. So everything that you create underlying is is divided and create uh, saved in in. So just one second. I can show this a bit slow. So um, if you go and you query this right. Um, so all the data that you create is pretty much saved in the primary data account um, and and sorry, it's just it's just a bit stuck, but essentially it's, it's in the uh, ADLS. Yes, and then it can be loaded, of course, into Spark data frames for yeah, that is true. More and you can just right click and and load the data into uh, it's at the loading and querying the data is very easy for exploratory purpose. So whether it's a parquet file data file, just go and right click on it and select whether you can query it via SQL or you can query it via Spark as well. I mean, load into a data frame and do whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, so this is a parquet file. 
and I'll have an option. I can right click. You see, I can go and select top 100 rows. I can select into load into data frame. So it's it's pretty. Uh, you have the option and liberty to choose any runtime of your choice you want. Uh, one more question, uh, maybe more from an architectural perspective, is uh, uh, where do you see um, SSAS uh, uh, or or basing basically the Azure Analysis Services uh, playing into this uh, architecture? that you have so i think um the ssas is again um for my understanding is is uh, although i'm not a power bi expert but essentially if you want to reduce the latency more and and it's it's a for the on-prem workload so so essentially you want to cache some data you're going to pre pre-build some models and then where you can even leverage that as well and and connect it with with analysis services and and further get consumption so so you know that is also possible Okay, let me see a, a few more questions that have just been published. Why can Power BI be made to query data set directly from ADLS instead of importing it uh, into the workspace? So, uh, directly into ADLS, this is already querying your data directly as well. So, if, if you just want uh, your data, you just need to create a load into a frame. Maybe you want to create a view on top of it. Or uh, if the question is, I mean, um, if you're using the, the 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 point here is that when using Synapse, you have an option of of not going out into a Power BI. Whether using uh, you know, when um, uh, 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 you can create your own report over here, like you use your Power BI desktop as well. So what you do is you can and you also have an option of downloading this report into your Power BI desktop and then publishing it on your workspace and then everything will be just shown uh, whenever you 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 come into the workspace. So it, it's it's more like you have an option of using it individually, but when you're using Synapse, it, it bundles up everything uh, together under just one workspace. So, so by the ease of use and creation, it's very, very convenient. One last question over here is, when does uh, Synapse use Polybase? I guess uh, there could be a different scenarios. Do you want to take that or Rohan? Polybase are used uh, essentially to query the data sets, which are uh, where you create an external file format first, and then and Polybase is also for virtualization. Essentially, uh, where you're using a SQL Server, you want to query a data set that is outside of maybe just a flat file or anything. You you create Polybase here. Um, here you have an option of creating an external data data, data uh, external table as well, where you create external file format. Um, but again, uh, that that is the virtualization um, uh, is also provided where you can create the table, external table, and then query it as well. Any more questions from the audience? Maybe let's give it a minute or so uh, for more questions. Thanks, Rohan, for uh, for the clarifications. And um, I hope that this uh, helps people to understand uh, uh, why Synapse Analytics is is kind of very relevant in today's uh, you know uh, migration of workloads and why we are heavily relying on it as well. So it's a brilliant service. It gives you not only just independence to query anything. But it also bring everything in one umbrella, right? Whether you want to collaborate with the ML workspace, whether you want to use the Power BI, and wherever you're ingesting from. So although everything is possible outside using other services, but with a single pane, I think this this relieves. Uh, because if you see other other thing right now, now if I if I was just querying the parquet data set that is in your, and if I'm using Databricks, I'll have to first go and mount it and then query here with SQL Serverless pool. I just do right click and and, and you know I can I can definitely query the data or uh, just. Just with few few clicks. All right. So, so a few uh, um, a, a few uh, general questions uh, that I see, and um, uh, so is. Um, uh, uh, you know, there is question around. OK, what's the calendar of uh, the Azure Data Fest that was shown in the beginning? So 
uh, this this uh, session has been uh, recorded and then uh, can be uh, can be seen again. If we have a chance now, we will uh, project that uh, uh, the slide um, uh, right away. But uh, you should also be receiving the same calendar by uh, email and you can replay this uh, session to, uh, to have an explanation. So as uh, we were mentioning at the beginning, uh, we just uh, started in and the uh, the session, the next sessions will explore uh, a little bit more of certain uh, uh, particular use cases that are relevant to um, big data sets and especially way to process uh, large logs. So we have uh, technologies and platforms that specialize on those use cases uh, and to uh, slice and dice that uh, large volume of data uh, in a very um, uh, with very fast performances. And so they complement uh, uh, what uh, Rohan has taken us through today, uh, uh, basically <clears throat> from a Synapse perspective. So you bring the data in, you can analyze it into Synapse. For certain uh, use cases, so you can also leverage additional uh, technologies, uh, like for example, Azure Data Explorer. And then we will talk about uh, data governance. Because once you have uh, multiple data sets and uh, transformations uh, and the deri uh, derivation of new data sets, you will need a certain point in time to have uh, to introduce uh, governance. So roles and processes that uh, can help manage uh, all these different data that you have on the cloud. And we will also be talking about the machine learning and infrastructure. So the, 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 the calendar uh, is, uh, uh, is available uh, uh, there. Um, yeah, and so if there are no more questions, uh, then uh, we would just like to thank you uh, for your attendance today. And uh, we hope that uh, the content uh, presented was useful to you, and we look forward to see you in the next session.